In the winter of 1923, I took ownership of a two-storey muse cottage in the heart of one of the most sought-after residential enclaves in London. I shall not give details of the address in order to prevent the ghoulish from making pilgrimage. It is a highly respectable and affluent area, and I doubt the well-to-do residents would appreciate the unwelcome intrusion of the great unwashed, venturing into their cobbled streets as thrill-seekers. No. I seek only to share my unsettling experiences therein. The exclusive, secluded nature of the Muse is one of its great attractions. Off the main thoroughfare, mine was a very pretty cottage in a terraced row of the same. Originally built as stables, they retained many common characteristics post-conversion to residential units, which included coach doors, original brickwork and timber beams. Perfectly charming bijou residences in the centre of the metropolis, much sought after and more affordable than the larger properties that surrounded it. I had considered myself exceedingly lucky to have received the fortuitous tip from the estate agent, my brother-in-law, before it was officially on the market. I place special emphasis on was, for my opinion was to change dramatically upon taking up residence. The first few days of my residency were unremarkable. I made myself at home on the weekend before returning to work on the Monday, and owing to the close proximity of my office, I had only a brisk ten-minute walk to and fro, which was a significant improvement on my previous daily commute. Many owners seemed to enjoy a sense of village-style community. The lack of gardens bringing people out to walk their dogs or simply stand on their doorsteps and pass the time of day, and on my toing and froing I had opportunity to tip my hat and greet my new neighbours with a cheery hello or good evening. It was on the Friday around 3.30pm as I returned home early from work that I first caught sight of a formidable grand dame was out walking her miniature German schnauzer. It was already dark, but she cut quite a figure in the light of the street lamps, in her anachronistic Edwardian garb, with feathered hat. As she drew closer, I could see her face was unlined but aged. I tipped my cap. Ah, oh, you must be our newest resident, she exclaimed in delight. Felix S., Esquire, at your service, ma'am, I replied. Delighted to make your acquaintance, Mr. S. She raised a monocle to her right eye and examined me thoroughly, top to toe. And I am Lady B., Lady Octavia B., widow. You are one of the Hertfordshire S.'s, I assume? Indeed, I replied. I dropped my haunches and addressed the schnauzer, who greeted me with enthusiasm. And what's your name, little fellow? I asked, tickling him under the chin. His name is Fang, the good lady replied on the wee pup's behalf, and he seems to have taken quite the shine to you. It is a good omen. He is a highly intuitive empath, and an excellent judge of character in my experience. I stood, smiled, and made to take my leave. I do hope you'll settle in comfortably, Mr. S., she said in closing. I think you will find we are a neighbourly sort on this street. If I can assist you in any way, you will find me three doors down. Entering my snug little bolt hole, I removed my hat, overcoat, and jacket and hanging them in the hall, slipped off my shoes and flexed my toes in gratitude upon their release from confinement. I loosened my tie as I entered the sitting room, then lay on the couch for forty winks, as was my habit, on a Friday before dinner. I must have underestimated my fatigue, as forty winks turned into a hundred and forty and it was a good two hours later that I was awoken by a rapping on the front door. Lady B stood on the doorstep. 
She held a china plate covered in a tea towel in one hand with fang tucked under the opposite arm. She took in my dishevelled appearance but did not comment upon it and instead announced, A housewarming gift. And she held the plate towards me. It's a plate of my legendary Sultana scones, best enjoyed while still warm. You shouldn't have, I said as I took the proffered plate. Nonsense, she replied with a gracious smile. I enjoy baking, it gives me something to do when I'm not walking fang here. She paused, and I noted she appeared to be craning her neck to see past my shoulder. Would you like to step inside? Had she not been holding Fang, I believe she would have clapped her hands. Well, perhaps for a minute or two, if I'm not inconveniencing you. She stepped over the threshold, and as I shut the door, she bent to place Fang on the hall floor. It's always so fascinating to see what people have done to these interiors. At the point at which the dog's paws touched the floorboards, all hell broke loose. Fang went quite mad, howling and yapping. He literally raced up the hall stairs, back down again, into the downstairs parlour, then the kitchen. He scratched at the cellar door, then raced back up the stairs again. His distress was obvious and vocal and alarming. I finally managed to catch him on his third turn at the cellar door, and hand him back, whimpering and shaking, into the arms of his distressed owner. Goodness me, goodness me, whatever is the matter, my little darling, she inquired solicitously. Fang simply buried his head in her generous bosom. She turned back to the door. She was trembling herself. I'd better get the poor dear boy home. I don't know quite what to say, Mr. S. He's always been a delicate creature, but he's never behaved like this before. I do apologise. No need, no need at all, I said, letting her out onto the street. Once the door was closed, I stood silently in the hall for a while. I strained my ears for any sound or disturbance within, but there was none. I must admit I was rather unsettled by the strange and disconcerting nature of the event proceeding. It was as if an undercurrent of malevolence had been detected in what had here for two been sanctuary. I spent a quiet evening taking a light supper. The scones were to prove a comforting distraction and quite delicious. Then I attended to outstanding correspondence before reading until bedtime. As bedtime approached, a heightened awareness of rattling or creaking sounds in the upstairs room, the sighing, the moaning of wind passing through cracks all served to fuel my growing sense of unease. Later, as I lay dozing in my darkened bedroom, I found myself aroused, strangely aroused, by a sour smell that seemed to pervade my nostrils. At the exact same moment, I began to hear a gentle tapping on the window. Then two ideas dawned simultaneously. The first, was that the tapping was coming from inside, not outside. And the second was that the ripe stench that had now filled the room was that of horse manure, though I knew not the source. Priding myself that I am no coward, I leapt from my bed and made a dash for the window. There was no one tapping, inside or out. I threw back the curtains, lifted the sash and thrust my head out gazing up and down the empty street and taking deep gulps of cold night air. The stench began to dissipate, and leaving the window open, I returned to my bed, lit the bedside lamp and buried myself under the covers until morning. I was not to be disturbed again that night. I awoke with a head cold and a slight temperature. I didn't dress but stayed in my pyjamas, and with the addition of a warm checked dressing gown and slippers, made my way down to the kitchen and forced myself to rustle up and eat a hearty breakfast. True, I could barely taste it, but I've always been of the mind that one should feed both a cold and a fever, and starve neither in order to aid recovery. Still the task completed, I was of use to neither man nor beast, 
and spent much of the day with my feet up on the couch, lolling about and feeling sorry for myself. It was at times like this that I most longed for a helpmate, someone who would fuss and coddle me in my ill health. Though I loved the bachelor life, it did have certain disadvantages, and I resolved that, once recovered, I would look to engage a servant to perform that very function. I thought back fondly on my Batman in the 1914-18 war. Dear Charlie P., a soldier servant I had selected from amongst my men, and had him assigned to attend to my daily needs and those of my bat horse, Blackie, who carried the pack saddle with my officer's kit during the various campaigns we had been engaged in. It was the custom and tradition, and not without advantages, to both parties. Every inch the tough East End ruffian, Charlie had performed his duties admirably and attentively, and I saw to it that he was rewarded with a promotion to the rank of corporal. Sadly, we lost touch upon being discharged. I had hoped he might follow me into a later civilian life as my manservant, and I often wondered if he had fallen back in with a bad lot, and returned to his pre-war life on the borders of petty criminality. As the sky grew dark, I made a valiant attempt to overcome my inertia and launched into my thrice-weekly exercise routine with barbell and dumbbells, then ran a bath, liberally sprinkling menthol bath crystals into the tub, which turned the water a turquoise blue. There'd been a Christmas gift from Aunt Gertie, the sort you think will never prove useful, but in the event, had. As I undressed, I experienced the queerest of sensations that of being observed in my nakedness. My skin prickled, as if an invisible entity examined me in my entirety, and I hastened to submerge myself in the bath and covered my private parts with a flannel. Relaxing back, I closed my eyes and let the menthol fumes do their work. I must have dozed then for a good ten or fifteen minutes, before the sound of a whimper disturbed me. I opened my eyes and saw, my feet, my toes, the taps above them, the forelip of the tub, and beyond it, nothing at all. At least, no person, no presence, nothing untoward. And yet, I was left with the conviction that I was not alone. It was quite the most extraordinary phenomenon. Even as I toweled myself dry, I could not shake off said conviction, and so, despite my malady and associated fatigue, I decided to dress and take a walk down to the embankment, to experience solitude and to calm my nerves. Alas, the Thames embankment proved no respite, for I cannot remember a time when I was so frequently asked for a light, or for the time of day, and by such a broad range of gentlemen. These strangers seemed to appear out of the shadows and the bushes at my every turn, and seemed intent upon engaging me in vigorous intercourse, though I politely declined their friendly overtures. Thus thwarted in my ambition, I turned for home, but even en route I felt I was being pursued by an unseen presence at my heels, and once inside my humble abode I wondered if I was, in fact, locking myself in with an intruder, not locking potential intruders out. The inside of the house struck me as unusually cold, my breath turning to vapour as I exhaled, and having hurriedly built up the fire in the sitting room, I poured myself a large whisky and collapsed onto the couch once more, pulling a rug over me on this occasion for additional warmth as I did so. Predisposed to fear, I found myself again a touching unwarranted significance to any random noise or flickering shadow which in any other circumstance would not even have been noticed. In this instance, however, they took on a spiritual nuance that could not be easily explained nor denied. 
But as I grew weary from watching and waiting for something that failed to materialise, I eventually fell fast asleep. Sleep proved to be the mechanism of time travel, for through this sleep our time slip occurred, over which I had no understanding of the process and no control whatsoever. And whilst I could blame no one for being highly sceptical of this assertion, I only know what I experienced, and my experience was this. I found myself, in spirit, if not in body, in much the same location only years before, when my current home had been a stable. The figure of a rough working lad of perhaps seventeen years of age, with pitchfork in hand, was cleaning out the stable floor whilst what appeared to be the coachman, a great hairy brute of a man with bald pates and thick neck, having unhitched the horse from its carriage, was berating it fulsomely for recently veering onto tram tracks and almost causing a collision. As the young stable hand cowered, the gentleman began to thrash the proud animal on its haunches savagely with his whip. After a moment's hesitation, the lad leapt forward in an attempt to wrestle the whip from the enraged coachman's hand, only to be thrust back violently and slammed against the stable wall for his trouble. The lad's eyes widened in astonishment as he rested there momentarily. Then, slowly, he slid down the wall, leaving a trail of blood and bone and brain matter in his wake. In horror and panic, the aggressor looked upon his handiwork ashen-faced, and I awoke to the clatter of the door-knocker. It was still dark outside, and I looked to the clock on the mantel. It was 8.15 a.m., and wouldn't be light for another hour. I went to the door, and opening it, was surprised to see Lady B and Fang. Apologies for disturbing you at this early hour, Mr. S. But I was walking my boy, and I saw this. She pointed down. On your doorstep. Is it yours? In the dim light cast into the hall from the sitting room, I looked down and saw an old tan leather satchel. I bent and, picking it up, placed it alongside the stick stand. My thoughts elsewhere. Fang regarded me curiously. He was an intelligent little fellow, I observed, and in a blinding flash I was inspired. Mrs. B., I began, might I trouble you for a loan of your little chap? A loan? Yes. I believe you were right when you said he is an empath and I'd like his assistance, if you'd just step inside. Oh dear, I hope this isn't going to upset him again. The spacious cellar had apparently changed little during the renovation. Electric light was provided by a single bulb, and the walls had been whitewashed, but the earth floor remained. Fang made straight for one specific spot in the corner of the room, and began digging furiously with his front paws. Boy, I told him. Good, good boy. Once I had handed Fang back to his mistress, and they had taken their leave, I returned to the cellar. I didn't have far to dig down to uncover the stable lad's remains. He was easily identifiable by the gaping hole in the back of the skull. I sang then a chorus of Nearer My God to Thee, and said a heartfelt prayer over him and wished him blessed release and peace ever after. I knew I would have to concoct some believable scenario for how I had discovered the body before I called the local constabulary, but that would wait. For now, I took my bath in quiet contemplation and relished the silence. Feeling decidedly better than the day before I dressed, descended the stairs and slipped on my overcoat, with the intention of dining at the local inn. It was only as I took my cape that I again caught sight of the old leather bag. Curiously, it struck me as strangely familiar. But as I now handled it, I realised it was not a satchel, as I had first thought, 
but part of my old military saddlebag. Indeed, it bore my gilt initials, faded as they were. Looking inside, I found the only contents were a letter addressed to myself in a familiar hand. I tore it open and read. Dear Captain Ash, Sir, as your former Batman, I have retained over the years a number of articles as a reminder of the happy time spent in your service and thought to return to you your saddlebag in case you want for a memory of your own dear Charlie, as you so oft times called me. I trust it reaches you safely. I hope the intervening years have been kind, sir. I tried my luck in the Americas, but having little success, returned to Blighty a few weeks ago. It was a happenstance I saw you down by the embankment and followed you home, but hesitated to disturb you due to my reduced circumstances, but instead have returned later with the bag and this note. As I say, sir, I find myself in very reduced circumstances at the moment and was wondering if you might, by any chance, be able to refer me to any potential employer or provide me with a reference for services rendered in the past. I trust you will forgive my boldness, sir, but if you are at all able and agreeable, I can be contacted care of the Ten Bells pub, Spitalfields, it was always my idea of an officer and a gentleman, sir. Yours faithfully, your own dear Charlie. Corporal C.W.P.